I am very pleased to welcome you to the 13th annual Suzette Tallarico Lecture. And um, I'll be handing it off to Dean Auer in just a moment, but I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank you all for being here and especially to acknowledge um, Suzette's son and daughter-in-law who are with us today. And, um, and I'm hopeful that we all have a chance to, to get to meet their uh, beautiful little girls, um, I think who inherited a little twinkle in their eye from, uh, from a grandmother uh, next go round. Uh, this particular lecture series is dedicated to Dr. Tallarico, and um, she was a, a big proponent of bringing together academics and practitioners to discuss important issues facing the justice system. And each year we have really benefited from some timely um, opportunities for all of us to discuss uh, these issues. Now, after the lecture is given today, you'll have an opportunity to uh, insert in the Q&A, you use the Q&A box, the chat box is disabled, any questions that you have, and we'll make sure that Dr. Hans has an opportunity to answer them. And so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Matthew Auer. Thank you, Professor Hare. I'm delighted to uh, introduce everyone to Valerie Hans. Valerie Hans is the Charles F. Recklin Professor of Law at Cornell University, and she conducts empirical studies of law and the courts and is one of the nation's leading authorities on the jury system. She's trained as a, a social scientist and has carried out extensive research and lectured around the globe on juries and jury reforms, as well as the uses of social science and law. She's the author or editor of nine books and over 150 research articles. Current projects include developing a new theory of damage awards, analyzing how jury service promotes civic engagement, and examining the impact of race in tort decisions. Professor Hans is also studying the diverse forms of citizen participation in legal decision making in other countries. Her research and that of others are summarized in a recent co-edited book from 2021 called Juries, Lay Judges, and Mixed Courts, A Global Perspective. Professor Hans is co-editor and uh, she's co-editor of the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. She's editor of the Annual Review of Law and Social Science, and she's past president of the Law and Society Association. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Valerie Hans as the 2022 Suzette Tallarico lecturer, and I turn over the virtual podium to Professor Hans. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciated that beautiful introduction, Dean Auer. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm just so honored to be here uh, giving a lecture commemorating Suzette Tallarico, who was, as you've been hearing, a beloved political scientist, an important member of the University of Georgia uh, community. And I'm especially grateful to Suzette Tallarico's family and uh, friends and colleagues for organizing this lecture in her remembrance to highlight important law and justice issues. I'd like to share my slides. Uh, so um, you'll have to give me a head up, heads up if you can uh, see them now. <clears throat> Um, hearing, hearing no objection, um, I think you see my slides. So um, I, I wanted to start uh, with, um, with a, a photo of Suzette Tallarico, who I met um, early in my own career. I was uh, quite inspired by her energy, her research, and her writing, and have learned since then about her very significant impact as a, uh, a terrific teacher at the University of Georgia. What I saw at the core of her work was a commitment to analyzing and improving the operation of the legal system. Um, she studied, as some of you may know, policing, courts, corrections, criminal sentencing, tort litigation too, among other topics. And what, at least from the outside to me, appeared to animate her work was uh, this belief that if we document problems, if we document and give evidence um, about challenges and difficulties that the system is experiencing, um, that's the first step in improving it. So what I'm hoping to do today in her honor is to 
uh, speak about a topic in my own area of research, <clears throat> um, and in particular to analyze how juries contribute to democracy. Now, if you're following the news and who isn't, um, some people say democracy is actually in a fair bit of trouble. Um, the, there's a, a, an index called the Democracy Index, and I uh, checked the 2021 Democracy Index, which categorized the United States as a so-called flawed democracy for some of the reasons that you see listed here the unfortunate political polarization that characterizes some of our discourse, uh, misinformation communicated through you know, means like social media, as well as regular uh, news channels, um, assaults on the press, corruption in government, um, and um, domestic terrorism. Uh, and um, uh, looking at this, you, you worry a bit, like, um, if our democracy is in trouble, what can we be doing about it? Um, but, but actually, um, my own, the, the institution I've spent a lot of my life studying also seems to be at um, a crossroads. What I've um, shown here is uh, taken from a, uh, a new paper that's coming out and will be published next year at the University of Georgia Law Review with uh, Richard Jolly and Robert Peck. Um, and um, this shows the uh, dramatic decline from the 1960s um, to 2020 in trials of all sorts, uh, both bench trials and jury trials. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, if, if jury trials are going away, um, should we be worried about it? Um, the pandemic has actually added to this downward slide in jury trials. Um, you know, many courts across the country shuttered their doors um, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, at the very moment where we were facing a crisis and might have benefited from one another's support, we retreated for safety reasons um, and uh, jury trials among other collaborative institutions uh, suffered. Now, some states simply stopped holding jury trials. Um, when they restarted, they tended to restart criminal trials, which um, uh, in many places have a a limited period of time in which you know charges can be brought um, and trials should be hold um, and held uh, and then um, and civil trials took a back seat to those important criminal trials totally understandably but in the years 2020 to 2021 um, there were vanishingly small numbers of jury trials in state courts and in federal courts um, here you see some of the ways courts tried to manage. I mean, some went to virtual trials like we're doing here in a virtual presentation. Uh, and um, the jury trials um, in a pandemic, um, uh, that was one option. The other option was holding in-person trials, but trials where instead of a jury box, the jury wound up deliberating in the entire courtroom um, so that they could safely socially distance with masks. So, um, you know, that's got to raise the question, um, are these master virtual versions of trial by jury the same as sitting face to face around a table with others in the jury room to deliberate on a verdict? Um, many doubt it, but we don't really know yet whether or not it is actually essentially the same phenomenon. Another question um, that I face as I study the jury system <clears throat> has to do with longstanding challenges to choosing representative juries. Uh, and what I hope to argue later here is that it's critically important that our juries represent the community at large. Um, but uh, what you can see here on this slide are some reminders that this has really been a longstanding problem. Of course, at the very start of the jury system in our country uh, in, during the colonial period, uh, jury service was limited only to uh, white men uh, who had property. Uh, and um, African Americans were excluded, women were excluded. And although those um, two groups uh, did gain the um, political right to participate on juries over the next centuries, um, still, um, we can't really say we had representative juries um, uh, until maybe the 1970s, late 1960s, 1970s, when juries started um, imperfectly, but nonetheless started to look like um, the rest of the country. 
Here you have uh, black jurors not necessary. That's a headline from a Supreme Court case um, that uh, upheld a verdict when a, a black defendant had been uh, uh, charged by an all white grand jury, even though the community had been 80% African American. The pictures of um, Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin um, remind us of the um, very unrepresentative jury that heard uh, that case. Um, Florida, as you might know, has six person juries in serious uh, criminal cases. And uh, Zimmerman was acquitted by an all woman jury, um, which was composed of five, um, five white people and one non-white person, um, and just underscoring the consequences when you rely on six person uh, selections of individuals from the community, as opposed to the larger 12 person members of the uh, 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 selections from the community. It's, it's really difficult to get anything looking like a cross section um, when you are uh, choosing only six people from a jury pool. And finally, closer to your home, um, we're reminded of um, the challenges um, in uh, the Arbery case in which, although there were a significant number of people of um, mixed race and African-Americans in the um, jury pool, the defense attorneys in that case used uh, virtually all of their peremptory challenges to remove African-Americans from the jury. Uh, one remained, uh, but, uh, but you can see this, this is a long kind of long standing pattern. And we, um, uh, we it, it does raise the question, if you have juries that are non-representative, you know, does this really interfere with their ability to understand the evidence in the case and to apply the law fairly um, and in a way that reflects the community perspective on um, the, uh, the facts at, at issue? So my question in reflecting on some of these trends, which uh, worry me uh, quite a bit, is can we, what can we do? Uh, could we use social science techniques, legal rules to meet some of these challenges so that we can best realize uh, what I believe and what I want to argue is the democratizing potential of trial, of, of, uh, trial by jury. You might know that trial by jury actually has a long pedigree. Of, it dates to the colonial period in the United States, but um, in, uh, in England, um, some of the very earliest jury trials were held um, in the 12th century. So, um, so we're talking about a very long pedigree. I mean, those, those jurors were different from our jurors, obviously, uh, but nonetheless, they included a body of people from the community that was selected to weigh in on and decide um, the facts in cases um, of concern and uh, importance to their community. Now, um, one of the fascinating things that I discovered with my collaborator, Sonia Kutenjak Ivkovic, uh, a, a criminologist at the University at, at Michigan State University, is that um, um, there's lot. There are actually a fair number of juries are in the nations around the world. Um, in the book that um, Dean Auer mentioned, um, we document um, the use of lay people as legal decision makers um, in different legal systems and different nations around the globe. And um, interestingly, even though there are lots of professionally trained judges around the world in most of the countries of the world, close to two thirds of the nation of the uh, globe's uh, legal systems have some form of lay participation, including 56 that have trial by jury, um, which involve a kind of independent group of individuals who decide cases uh, with, um, uh, with the judge um, being separated during the decision-making process. Uh, and again, I want to um, argue that one of the reasons for this persistence of lay participation, including in juries, is that it, uh, it does have um, a capacity to strengthen uh, democracy. And it does so for what I believe are a variety of reasons. First of all, when you open the courtroom door to lay people, um, the representatives of the people at large, um, the audience expands. And it expands because when you bring ordinary people into the courtroom, the lawyers who are there, the, ju 
the judge who was professionally trained in law and the lawyers can no longer speak to each other in their private legalese language. Um, they have to speak in a way um, that is accessible um, to the lay fact finders. And because it has to be accessible to the lay fact finders, it also opens up the audience um, to the community at large. So by the presence of lay people in the, um, in the courtroom, um, we have opened the doors wider uh, and, um, and encouraged uh, the legally trained individuals to reflect on what they are doing and to communicate um, through, uh, through more ordinary language. Uh, so that winds up increasing the transparency of what is going on in the courtroom. Um, if you've got to speak in regular language you, and, uh, and convince uh, lay fact finders, you've got to be transparent um, doing it. So the community also has a role to play um, in uh, determining the outcomes because their representatives are making decisions, binding decisions in the case. So that's another way in which um, the jury serves as this um, vehicle for connecting um, the, the, the community and um, the outcomes of the case. You know, juries decide what, what kinds of outcomes deserve community com condemnation and punishment. Um, what civil wrongs deserve compensation? So the community through the jury decides on those. And finally, one of the things that we have discovered is serving on a jury has effects on the jurors themselves. Um, it tends to shore up democratic attitudes and behaviors. Research by sociologists and political scientists and psychologists um, have all documented um, a, a great deal of uh, beneficial um, consequences, uh, to be sure, some problems too, but uh, beneficial consequences for making decisions in groups. As you can see here, um, you can um, in, in foster the exchange of information um, and different perspectives. Um, you get an opportunity to really test your views by trying to convince somebody else who maybe didn't see the evidence the same way that you do. And in fact, as a result, you might change your views or re refine your views. Um, it facilitates comparisons across individuals uh, in the way in which they might see things either similarly or differently. And it allows you to um, share the work, um, share the burden. Uh, in juries, people with special expertise might be especially helpful in um, under helping the rest of the jury understand the meaning and significance of particular kinds of evidence um, in the case. But clearly um, it's not all groups, but especially um, diverse, uh, heterogeneous groups that have some of these um, very positive consequences. Sometimes groups that are extremely similar um, uh, create an echo chamber. Uh, it's uh, groups with uh, inherent diversity that seem to uh, manage to realize some of these benefits of deciding in groups. Now, uh, university faculty here at, uh, at Georgia, at the University of Georgia, have, have studied the issue of diversity in judges in particular. I, I uh, draw your attention to the amazing work of uh, Susan Heron, Laura Moyer, Christina Boyden, Adam Rutkowski. Um, uh, uh, both of these projects, and I suspect uh, many others, um, look at uh, the way in which people are influenced by by gender, by race, uh, and how that contributes to uh, decision-making in collective environments um, with respect to judges. So I wanna look at diversity with respect to juries. And um, to do that, I, I want to use as an illustration a um, particular research project that I think illustrates quite well what happens when you have a diverse as opposed to a homogeneous group. And I'll draw on a project that uh, is, uh, has, has gotten to deserve, it, um, I think, a notice uh, by a Tufts University professor, a psychologist, uh, Sam Summers, who conducted um, a mock jury experiment where he developed a recording of a case, a criminal case, and uh, played it for jurors. And he played it for jurors of two juries of two different types. 
Um, he used the local jury pool in uh, Michigan and also in uh, uh, put out ads, community ads, to try to get a cross section of the population, the local population in Michigan. And he formed these individuals into two different sets of groups and they were randomly assigned to either an all white um, six person jury or a diverse jury. Um, so uh, given the local population, he did not have sufficient numbers of people to uh, put uh, individuals together in all black juries. Um, so he may do uh, with what he had to contrast what happens in fact finding with a all white jury and a diverse jury uh, that included two African Americans and four whites. Uh, and the um, the comparing the the jury's judgments, I think uh, you know I've I've got some evidence here. This is this is before people actually um, uh, deliberated as groups. They saw the video together or watched the recording um, together as a group. So they knew what group they were in and who they would be deliberating with. Um, but they had not yet actually engaged in the prospect of del deliberation. So they were anticipating deliberation, but they had not actually engaged in deliberation. And I think there's some really interesting things about these uh, data. First of all, you see black jurors, these are on those diverse juries, um, have a different approach uh, to this case. Um, the case, about a quarter of them were willing to say the evidence initially managed uh, for them to convey the, uh, the evidence was sufficient for a guilty verdict. Um, the whites on all white juries, um, uh, twice as many of them um, thought, yeah, um, the evidence is sufficient for a conviction in this case. But I want to draw your attention to this middle group. These are white jurors on diverse juries. The only difference between them and the whites on all white juries is who they were anticipating talking to. Uh, and, um, and what you see is that uh, pulls down um, their willingness to say, yeah, I think we should convict um, this particular defendant. Um, so uh, that difference actually persisted through the deliberation. Um, and what you can see here is uh, that um, the uh, once, once again, black jurors create or contribute diverse and different types of um, information, um, as you can see by the, uh, the numbers here. But again, if you look at the bolded numbers in this slide, white jurors and diverse juries mentioned more novel case facts, were more accurate, and raised questions about missing evidence more than their counterparts, their white counterparts on those all white juries. So diversity in juries seems to have these two different effects. First of all, it brings different voices to the table, um, but then also it influences uh, the other uh, people um, who are sitting at the table. Uh, and uh, so, so you get these multiple effects of, uh, of diversity on juries. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, we like the fact finding uh, advantages of diverse juries. If, if we're thinking, you know, how do we create juries that really will do a good job of representing the community and um, making sure that uh, the decisions are as accurate as possible. Um, however, there are what I would call democracy enhancing effects too. Um, so jury service generally increases regard for the courts. You as a juror are participating in the courts and you gain more positivity about the courts in a way that direct participation kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, influences how you think about the entire um, event. Uh, and um, the, uh, the other, you know, benefit is that you're learning some things, you know, by your participation, you're seeing justice done, you're seeing what happens as the judge manages the trial, um, as evidence is presented by both sides, and you recognize the power that you're given uh, to make a binding decision in the case. So, you're educated about the law. Um, and what we've learned through research is it also tends to have some other behavioral effects. Um, the uh, French thinker, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, 
uh, took a trip to America in uh, the 1800s, um, not what you would maybe call the best years of the United States, but nonetheless, um, uh, he observed uh, the jury system in action and um, had some actually fascinating observations about what he observed. And here I have a, a quote, the jury and more especially the civil jury serves to communicate the spirit of the judges to the minds of all the citizens. It uh, invests each citizen with a kind of magistry and makes them all feel the duties which they are bound to discharge towards society and the part which they take in government. Uh, and, um, and, and the Supreme Court says something very similar, you know, um, uh, over a century later, jury service protects, preserves, sorry, the democratic element of the law ensures continued acceptance of the law because it affords ordinary citizens a value opportunity, valuable opportunity to participate in the process of government. Um, it experience fostering, one hopes, a respect for law. Now, these assertions in the early 1800s and you know, 1991 were made without any empirical evidence. Uh, but um, we've, uh, and, and you might be thinking, wait a minute, aren't people always resisting serving on juries? Like, well, where's, where's that? Oh yeah, let me participate in government stuff. Um, uh, I, I encourage you to go on Twitter and do hashtag jury duty and you'll see, uh, let's just say the range of perspectives that people have toward um, toward the prospect of participating actively in this um, noble democratic institution. So here we have at the top, I got selected. We'll see how fast I can get disqualified. Um, but others say, doing my civic duty today. Uh, so you see the range of views that people um, have when they are called for jury duty. But interestingly, by the time they finish jury duty, they're they're pretty all pretty much all uh, positive about the experience. <clears throat> um, because we uh, courts courts routinely survey jurors afterwards, like how was the coffee? Do you need any changes to um, the jury orientation um, room? What was the overall experience like? And and that's a good thing to keep an open. Um, line of communication between the people you have conscripted uh, to reach decisions. Um, but one of the things that comes through loud and clear um, in uh, these uh, surveys is an overwhelming positivity. And, and surely some of the people in these surveys were those reluctant um, jurors that you saw on the previous slide. And um, whether they, uh, you know, um, shared their views on Twitter or not. Um, but uh, but we see they become more positive about the experience and also, again, more, more positive about the courts, seeing them as more fair and more just. And again, I think it is that participation, kind of psychology of participation in this meaningful group activity with other members of your community that leads uh, to this. Um, there's been some interesting work by uh, political scientists uh, who have studied um, the criminal jury experience and how it how it um, relates to uh, voter turnout um, in uh, among registered voters. Uh, so, in uh, one particular project that was done in Thurston County, Washington, for example, um, forty two point seven percent voted in a subsequent um, national election. Kind of not so good, but um, a pretty similar number um, of jurors who had had a, what I call, a, what the researchers called inconclusive experiences. And that would be because the parties settled during the trial or there was a mistrial, uh, not for a hung jury reason. Um, if jurors had conclusive experiences, that is they reached a verdict, it boosted the likelihood of voting in a subsequent election up uh, about 10 points. Um, so, uh, so in this study, they uh, tried to get an estimate of how much it mattered for jurors to participate uh, and, um, and, and looked at voting. Um, a subsequent study uh, had a, a national scope. Um, the Jury and Democracy Project researchers headed up by John Gastel, the political scientist John Gastel, um, looked at jury service and voting records for um, over 13,000 American jurors in different cities. And 
Um, what, what they did is they had voters, the, the kind of record of voters lists. So if you don't know, you should know that your record of voting is a public record. Um, and then in some cities, they were also able to get jury service records. And they looked for each individual juror at their history of voting, when their jury experience occurred, and their post-jury experience voting record. And what they found was, especially for people who were infrequent voters, um, in criminal cases, those individuals boosted their voting in the next election. So very much like the Thurston County project that I just saw that, that gave people the jury service, um, somehow connected them more with their communities and led them to um, vote uh, more likely engage in another civic activity after their jury service. Um, I worked with John uh, Gastel and one of his students also to look at the civil jury. Um, and, um, and we found that jurors, civil jurors who served on larger unanimous juries were also more likely to vote in the next election, considering their pre-jury service voting as a control. Um, so I think in these projects, what you see is um, a way in which the positivity that comes from serving as a juror actually um, uh, connects the juror, the individual juror, more to the community. I've had an amazing privilege of working with people in Argentina who have introduced new jury systems um, in a country that has never had a jury system. Right? So people are complete novices. They know nothing about it. Um, my collaborators and I have uh, distributed questionnaires to the judges, the lawyers, and the jurors who have served in some of these new jury systems. And uh, here, here you see a picture of a group of of uh, individuals who uh, were pretty happy at the end of their jury service. Um, one of the things we asked them was, did you, what did you know about you know, trial by jury in uh, this province uh, before you got your summons? And the vast majority had heard absolutely nothing or only a little bit. Um, but uh, once they had served, uh, they were um, the, the main, uh, uh, attitude that they expressed afterwards was a sense of pride uh, that they had been able to, um, even though they were complete novices, uh, manage uh, the presentation of evidence, understand the evidence, understand the legal rules, and um, deliberate together to arrive at a group decision. Um, and we also asked them some of the questions that came from that line of work on uh, um, deliberative democracy. Um, uh, we said, how has the jury experience affected your opinion regarding juries, courts, government, and uh, police. And they actually, um, the predominant view for the jury and for courts um, was positive, uh, that uh, they had um, instilled in them um, through that experience of directly observing um, the jury process and the trial process in action become more positive. Um, this turns out to be an incredibly important thing for Argentina, which uh, suffered under a military dictatorship and um, where uh, individuals who were judges in the legal system were suspected of colluding with the military dictatorship. Um, so the judiciary in Argentina was held in very, very low regard. So sharing power uh, with the jury um, seems to be one way of uh, trying to, in this new age, kind of post-military dictatorship, shore up the legitimacy of the legal system. So I guess I would say, you know, um, you're, uh, the, the trial by jury winds up, you know, en enhancing democracy through um, audience, through expanding um, the audience, because people can't speak in legalese anymore. Um, what is going on in courtrooms is more accessible to the rest of it, uh, the rest of us. Um, the transparency is enhanced. Um, communities contribute directly to the outcomes in cases, and jury service creates this greater connection between individuals and their communities at large. So um, I think all to the good, but uh, we can also, I think, do better um, because there are some continuing challenges. Um, we don't have representative juries in uh, many, many cases. 
Uh, some of the recent uh, high profile jury trials have raised questions about whether or not racial and other biases affect not only the jurors themselves, but also lawyers exercising peremptory challenges or judges exercising challenges for cause. Uh, and, um, and, and to be honest, there are some very complicated questions and issues uh, for um, the jury to deal with. And, and we should use social science in a way to take a look at what we might do to make the process um, as, as good as possible so that we can have fair and accurate juries at the other end. So um, my uh, collaborator, Sherry Diamond, and I have uh, just uh, had accepted for publication um, a, an article um, that we labeled Fair Juries. Uh, and there we lay out a blueprint for what we think are some important changes that need to be made. Um, they are research-based changes with one exception that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, we think there are some very straightforward research-tested ways to reform jury pool selection. If you start with a non-representative um, jury pool, you're not likely to get a representative jury because you've got to pick that jury from the non-representative jury pool. Uh, so we've got, we've got a number of suggestions on how to reform the jury pool selection. And we also think it's time to really rethink courtroom jury selection that in many places has been uh, characterized by very limited voir dire, attorneys relying on race and gender stereotypes, even though it's prohibited by the Constitution. Uh, and, um, and we need to recognize that the procedures laid out in Batson versus Kentucky in, in 1986 um, really have not been effective in, um, in addressing uh, bias in the exercise of peremptory challenges. Um, so we have, we have some suggestions that we'd like to make there. And we also want, uh, we thought it was important um, to uh, think about how to maximize fair trials. Um, if you've got a good representative jury and uh, that uh, you've managed to select from a representative cross-section of the population, there's still more to do in orienting that jury, uh, trying to instruct them so they will look at the evidence um, without eyes that are clouded by racial and other biases. And, and uh, we we had to we had to add make sure you're, it's twelve person jury not a not a six person jury. Um, the the one exception to the kind of research based uh, recommendations that we advocate here is anti bias jury instructions. Um, if you follow the Chauvin trial in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, um, you may have heard or seen some descriptions of the. Uh, anti-bias instruction the judge gave in that particular case. And uh, judges across the country are uh, adopting these instructions. Um, there's been very limited testing of them uh, and whether or not, I, I mean, they're, they're an easy thing to do in a way, uh, but um, are they really effective or do we need something more? Um, so uh, um, I'm uh, hoping to work um, on, in the planning stages of working with others uh, to uh, try to test um, these uh, in uh, mock jury type settings um, to see whether or not they're likely to be effective in real jury settings. So I want to encourage the students in the audience um, in your own domains of research and study to think about how your um, social science knowledge um, and uh, legal knowledge might um, help address the pressing problems that you observe in our country today. And I want to close with an illustration from Suzette Tallarico's um, own scholarship in collaboration with her, um, with her co-authors Eaton and Dunn. Um, over the last decades, many, many powerful voices have argued that we need to restrict the right to civil lawsuits um, and jury trials because of what they have claimed was a litigation explosion. And I got very interested in this debate because runaway juries were supposed to be one of the major villains um, in of this litigation explosion. Also, overly sympathetic judges, but the runaway juries really took front and center. Uh, so along with her collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Tallarico uh, analyzed um, tort litigation in the state of Georgia. And I've given you one kind of uh, illustrative example here that shows that uh, juries are convicting about half, uh, sorry, uh, finding liability about half of the cases uh, that they look at. Um, 
And, uh, and, and they conclude uh, with the statement, there's no evidence of a, of a tort crisis in Georgia. Outcome and damage data indicate that civil jury and personal injury trials frequently rules for defendants, awards modest compensation to those plaintiffs who do prevail, and rarely punishes defendants with punitive damages. So whatever your passion is, whatever you are most um, uh, concerned about, I encourage you to take um, a path uh, that was set uh, by Suzette Tallarico, applying your novel, your, your um, knowledge and skills to advocate for positive change. Uh, here is my contact information and links to some of my scholarship. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hans. So we'll invite questions from the audience and we have one, actually a couple already. So I will read them for you so that, and you can also see them so that the audience can see them as well. Um, so what is your opinion uh, on the, uh, what is the better way in order to educate jurors about implicit bias? And if in that direction, uh, the instructions, I guess, from the judge, uh, can they achieve that objective related to reducing implicit bias? Yeah, um, I, I, this is a great question. And that's why I really felt like it was critically important to do a test. And um, our current plan is to test something very similar to the Chauvin instructions and a very interesting video um, that is used to orient jurors. Uh, that's a longer video, so you're not just getting instructions in, you know, a mess of here are the charges, and then oh by the way, um, you know, don't be biased and recognize implicit bias. Uh, I think um, we will see whether or not either of those has the capacity to reduce bias. But I want to put in a plug for diverse juries because I do think having to decide a case with people who are different from you um, is one of the best ways that we already have if we could only make sure that our juries really reflected the community at large. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back. I, I don't know if um, the instructions, you know, legal instructions um, will have the kind of impact they have. Um, you know, I, I've got to say it might depend on the judge and what the judges uh, do. Uh, it's um, it's optional whether or not judges actually include themselves in uh, implicit bias statements. So um, uh, some standard instructions, for example, will say everyone has implicit biases, including me. <laughs> so the judge himself or herself um, makes the statement, oh, you know, I have this. It's, it's a natural part of being human and being in a society that is characterized by, um, you know, the, the kind of social world, social and political world that we live in. Um, but, uh, but my guess is it might be more impactful for the judge um, to say uh, explicitly, this is something that all of us share, and yet we have to be on guard uh, about it so as to arrive at a decision that's really based on the evidence in the case, rather than all the things we are bringing, all the baggage that we are bringing. Thanks, great question though. So the next question is from an attendee um, from South Korea. And uh, this person writes, there is no grand jury system in Korea. Can the grand jury system serve as a check and balance to make the prosecution process more democratized in light of the US case? Uh, well, um, welcome from South Korea. It's uh, wonderful to hear from you. I had the great pleasure of observing some of South Korea's jury trials um, some years, several years ago, uh, where I was very intrigued at some of the modifications that uh, South Korea has made in uh, juries. Um, for example, their juries are size eight um, and um, every case I saw uh, like started and ended in one day. Um, the the um, lawyers were very efficient of trying to think about ways that they could maximize um, sub, uh, responses and get a cross section of the population and, um, and have uh, people come in and be willing to serve as jurors, you know, early on in the time. And um, so they were very efficient and 
and focus the jury's attention just on the issues of discussion that needed discussion and debate. So I thought that was that was really, um, really interesting. Um, the other thing is that uh, juries uh, that can't agree have the professional judge uh, have an option um, as uh, the professional judge can enter the jury deliberation room and, and answer any questions. Um, and I thought I was so intrigued by that because of course in the United States, we do it totally differently. We say, no, there must be, if, if there's any relationship between any kind of communication between the judge and the jury, especially during deliberation, it, it must be written out. It must be part of the court record. We do that to try to protect the independence of the uh, jury in the US, uh, but, uh, but they don't um, do that in uh, South Korea. So fascinating to look at these kinds of, um, of these kinds of differences and, and reflect on what difference they make. So uh, congratulations on your interesting jury system. But back to the um, your question about um, grand juries. Um, I think uh, they grand juries have the potential uh, of standing as uh, in between the government and individuals who might potentially be charged um, with with crimes. Um, but uh, the way they are set up, they don't always act as an effective um, uh, uh, kind of check, I guess uh, you would say. Um, there is a famous U.S. Uh, kind of claim of a prosecutor could get a jury to indict a ham sandwich, meaning to indict anyone the prosecutor wanted to indict. And, and part of that is the prosecutor is the one who presents the evidence um, to the group of individuals in the grand jury. And uh, so uh, there is an asymmetry in the information that a grand jury gets. So I would say it has the potential, uh, but uh, probably um, is uh, not as effective as it could be uh, for as a body um, that serves the community's interests in prosecution or no prosecution. Uh, thanks. So our next question um, is a mixed court panel jury system less democratizing. We touched on this just a little bit. So, yeah. So. Um, Around the world, uh, mixed courts of professional judges and lay judges are actually more common than juries. Uh, so I think uh, something on the order of 70 some countries around the globe have mixed courts and uh, juries being in 56. Uh, so um, so what, are, what are some of the differences? Uh, one of them is that uh, lay people and professional judges would decide together, they would deliberate together. So just by way of example, there is a mixed court system called Saiban and Sado in Japan. And it uh, has three professional judges and six lay people who are picked like our juries are picked from the community at large. They all sit on a big bench at the front of the room. And then when the case has been presented to them, um, they may ask questions after the professional judge has questions. So they may ask questions of all of the witnesses too. But after the case is over, they retire and they deliberate together. Um, and uh, I think most lay judges who participate uh, believe it is a positive experience. So some of the <clears throat> civic engagement effects that I described with actual juries, some of the positivity about the court system also seem to be characteristic of at least some mixed court systems. Um, but, uh, but one of the um, uh, downsides, one of the limitations is, and as you might imagine, professional judges do tend to dominate the deliberation. And, you know, the, the sociologists and political scientists and psychologists among us would say, well, yes, of course, they've got, you know, they've got the relevant legal status and experience um, and know what's going on. And they can, um, they can draw the lay people um, to their, uh, uh, to their point of view, I think uh, fairly easily. Uh, and so, uh, so one question is, could you make a lay system, a mixed court system more democratizing? I mean, are there ways that you could um, in increase the independence of lay people? Um, one of the things that I have heard professional judges in these countries say is that they have started 
having the lay people give their opinions first before they give any of their opinions. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, that's one, one way you might do it. Others have considered the possibility, and some are experimenting with this, of having a separate discussion among the lay judges before they meet together with the professional judges. So uh, I, I don't know how I feel about that. I, I'd like to see what happens under these two circumstances, because in a way, you know, the work on jury diversity uh, suggests that it's really bringing people together who have very different perspectives, if they come together as equals, um, that um, would uh, foster the most accurate fact finding. So uh, anyway, a mixed a mixed response on mixed courts. So our next uh, question uh, focuses on the size of the uh, jury and um, notes that they had assumed uh, all juries were comprised of 12 members. How many states allow for six member juries and have they ever been challenged as unconstitutional? Well, there have been many efforts to try to challenge them as unconstitutional in criminal cases, but uh, they have not succeeded. And, you know, it's, I, I, um, I think that as um, people have seen some erratic decisions from six person juries, both in criminal cases and then also in civil cases, you know, with, with very unusual damage awards, um, they have reflected on, hmm, did we make a mistake saying six person juries were, um, you know, did not violate the constitutional right to trial by jury. I mean, when um, the Supreme Court decided on that, I mean, they basically rejected, you know, a thousand years of practice with larger juries. And I think judges sitting over six person juries um, cases with six person juries are, are starting to look for ways um, that they could, uh, they could um, uh, work within the system um, and uh, see whether or not um, they can, um, you know, as a matter of uh, court rule, um, increase uh, the number of jurors. And it's got to be a minimum of six, but uh, maybe they could increase it in different ways. Um, and this is a really fascinating uh, recent article in Judicature called Better by the Dozen that addresses just these kinds of issues and questions uh, about how, what judges can do to try to increase jury size, even without the constitutional um, rule being modified. Um, there are a modest number um, that have fewer than 12 uh, in states and that have fewer than 12 uh, person juries in criminal cases, serious criminal cases. But in civil cases, it's quite common um, to have smaller juries. Um, also, even if they're larger non-unanimous juries on the civil side. Uh, so um, those are some areas to look at in the future, ways that we might try to strengthen even more um, the jury decision-making process by requiring unanimity and having larger juries. That probably gets to our next question there too, unless you wanted to add, um, you know, what is known about jury size and its effect on uh, deliberations given unanimity requirements? Yeah, um, it's more robust, uh, larger juries and unanimous juries have more robust decisions um, there's a, that is the deliberation itself is um, livelier. There's more exchange of facts. I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, um, the larger jury is a better representation of the community, right? That's just a simple sampling um, uh, uh, fact, right? If you sample from a large community, six people, you'll get some unusual combinations. And with 12, you have a better shot at reflecting the community as it exists. Um, and, uh, and, and what we know is that in smaller juries, people who are unusual or maybe an outlier type person um, can have more impact than a larger jury. So that's one of the values of the larger jury. So we're getting down to the, the I guess, last uh, few minutes so we can get through these next couple of questions, I think. And so a follow-on question about um, test to reduce uh, a juror's bias. And specifically, what kind of test uh, are you referencing? Um, is it the Harvard test or are there others out there um, used, including cases of sexual violence? Um, or is there something else like a kind of task to do by the juries, um, including an exam? 
Yeah, well, some some articles in the uh, in the law review literature, anyway, do recommend that juries, uh, prospective jurors, all take the implicit ad, uh, you know, um, um, IAT, um, which measures preference for people of different races, uh, different sizes, uh, uh, genders, and so on. And I, that's just impractical. Um, what I meant by testing um, was really testing the effect of instructions. Can judicial instructions help reduce bias? Um, uh, judges are um, adopting anti-bias instructions, thinking that, well, this is something that I, I can do under a circumstance that, you know, from to me is, is negative. I, I want to make sure my juries are unbiased. Um, and here's something I can do. Uh, but, um, but they haven't been rigorously tested. And I think that's really the next step for those of us in the social science community. So, and our last question then, um, is there evidence this is kind of a quick follow on actually that a judge's instructions to ignore X or Y over the course of a trial work or not. And if so, would this evidence be a guide to the success or failure of anti bias instructions. Yeah, uh, so, so interesting. I think some things are just impossible to ignore. My very first research article was on criminal record and whether you could instruct people to ignore that fact. Um, you know, the answer is no. It's, it's a very interesting piece of evidence about a criminal defendant, and it has an impact even if you are instructed to disregard it. Um, other kinds of instructions, I think, do have a fighting chance. There is some scholarly work in the field of social psychology, for example, and cognitive psychology, that some forms of anti-bias instructions can work for short periods of time, but maybe that's all we need on the jury. Well, and uh, the timing was uh, perfect here. We really appreciate uh, all of the attendees who um, were able to, I think all of us learned a great deal, um, including those of us who teach in this area about these democratizing uh, effects and, um, and look forward to the next rounds of uh, research on all of these issues. And a special thank you uh, to Dr. Hans for joining us uh, today and we hope we'll see you all again um, at next year's Talarico Lecture. So thank you. Thank you so much.